we are in the Senate chamber in the most historic trial that's been had in this state in the last 100 years on this evidence. There is shame here, and the shame sits right there that they would bring this case in this chamber with no evidence. I am proud to represent Attorney General Ken Paxton. If this can happen to him, it can happen to anyone. Now, you heard when we started this case, you heard in the media that the evidence is 10 times worse than the public knows, but what a farce that was. What a farce that was. What we have seen instead is a bunch of supposition, mites, maybes, could have been. That's what we've seen in this trial. The very first witness they brought to you, the very first witness they brought to you, it's not working, crumbled under oath. Do you remember? Do you remember Jeff Mateer? Crumbled under oath. So what is this case about? It's about nothing. It's about nothing. Think about it. They failed to gather all the evidence. They failed to review their own evidence. They failed to talk to all the witnesses. Think about this. Brent Webster, the first assistant, did they bring him here? Did they even bother to ask him a question? They didn't even ask him a question. He is the man who reviewed and documented every single thing that occurred. They didn't even call him. You know why they didn't call him? Because he puts to bed all of their foolishness and silliness. They didn't take any sworn testimony. They let witnesses assume and speculate. They failed to even understand the law. And they couldn't even write the articles correctly. Look at the articles that the judge just read to you. They use words pro tem. Their own witnesses admit there was no attorney pro tem. They use words like the, the, the attorney general failed to protect charities. That is not the attorney general's job. And let me make sure we're clear about something here. When the House Board of Managers brought this case, they made an assumption. They assumed that this man would quit. They assumed that this man would run and hide. They assumed that Attorney General Ken Paxson would resign. Well, guess what? He did not resign. He is proud and is ready to go back to work. And after this is over, I expect he will go back to work. He has been a rock. He has been a rock, and that office, the Office of Attorney General, has accomplished more than any Attorney General's office in the country. You heard it from the witness stand. Biden's policies come to die in Texas because... Attorney General Ken Paxton. Now let's talk about the burden of proof. We've heard about the burden of proof here and there. Is this working? Can I have one minute? Can we get this working? They thought he would quit. They thought they could bring a bunch of people, 15 people, not put under oath with a bunch of supposition and guesses and mites and maybes, and they thought he would quit. The Texas Tribune, the Dallas Morning News, the Houston Chronicle, they thought he would quit. He did not quit. He did not quit. And he will not quit. Let's talk about the burden of proof. 
That is super important here. And I want you, senators, please, to look at your screen and look at the burden of proof. Beyond a reasonable doubt. Beyond a reasonable doubt. That means, that means that you have no doubts that are reasonable. No doubts. That is an incredibly high burden. Can you imagine if we were in any criminal court in the United States that this case would not have already been dismissed based on what we've heard from this witness stand? This case would not even, we would not be in final argument. This case would be over. But this is not a criminal trial. This is a political trial. I would suggest to you this is a political witch hunt. I would suggest to you that this has, this trial has displayed for the country to see a partisan fight within the Republican Party. Let's just call it for what it is. That's what we're seeing here. It's being played out on TVs across the country. There is a battle for power. Because there's no doubt that these folks did not prove a case. They didn't prove... A preponderance, they didn't prove anything other than they don't like Ken Paxton. Remember this fellow, Greg Cox. You remember that guy? Greg Cox. Maybe, potentially, possibly, might have, perhaps, conceivably, could be. He thought, he testified that the Attorney General's office was so corrupt, they're involved in organized crime, but you know what? I want to go work there. What a joke. What a joke. I had texts from my former Marine Corps buddies that said, that guy is a joke. To come in here in the Senate of Texas and to get on the stand, and these people sponsored this guy. What a joke he was. And in my view, that's exactly what their entire case has been. A joke. Much ado about nothing. The burdens of proof. Look at the burdens of proof, senators. Beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, if you decided this case from the Houston Chronicle, the Texas Tribune, Texas Monthly, the Dallas Morning News, oh, my goodness gracious, Ken Paxson's guilty. There ain't no evidence to support it. The only evidence we have in this case is they don't like Ken Paxton. And there is no doubt. There have been hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of articles about Ken Paxton, how bad Ken Paxton is. Everybody has heard it, and guess what? The voters heard it too, and guess what? Ken Paxton won hands down resounding victory. He beat the latest in line for the bushes. Let it be known. Let it be clear now. The Bush era in Texas ends today. We thought it had ended in the primary when Ken Paxton beat George P. Bush 68 to 32. Well, we thought it was over. It wasn't. Well, now we have an impeachment. It ends today. They can go back to Maine. This is Texas. This case has been nothing more than assumptions. And you know what my dad used to tell me? Assumptions make an ass out of you and me. And that's been this entire case. It's all built on assumptions. And jumping to conclusions. Think about it. House repairs were paid for by Nate Paul. You know how sad this is? I had to come here on behalf of the Attorney General of the state of Texas and disprove their case because he had already been convicted in the press. And now we know. I had to prove it to young Drew Wicker. That young man believed, oh, uh, you know, I heard a stray comment. And I jumped to a conclusion that the house repairs were paid for by Nate Paul. We all know now that was wrong. We all know now that was wrong, but that was in more than 100 articles across our country, smearing this man's name, smearing his wife's name, smearing a member of this body's 
name. And we all saw it when we put this young man under oath and showed him the documents. Guess what? Didn't happen. Wasn't true. And that is indicative of their entire case. We should not be in a position to where we have to come in here and prove our innocence. But we did. We did. The referral from the DA's office had nothing to do with banks. All of his top lieutenants had no idea there was a second referral. You know why they didn't know? Because the referral went directly to Mr. Kamek. They didn't know about the direct referral from the DA's office. And you remember Margaret Moore? She came in here and tried to pretend like she didn't know anything about it because she wasn't supervising her staff. Her staff knew all about it. Her top lieutenant knew all about it. They assumed the Kamek contract was never executed, but now we all have seen that Ken Paxton, in fact, signed that contract. They assumed that Laura Olson's job was not legitimate, but now we have seen her employment contract. We've seen her application. We've seen that she's still working for world-class properties and still doing real work. They assumed, they assumed that Wicker, young man Wicker, delivered a secret package in the middle of the night in a dark alley. Never happened. But if you were to watch the news and read the newspaper, Oh, my goodness, that happened. Even a Texas Ranger, a Texas, think about this for a minute. You have a guy, six foot six, wears a hat, cloaks with the authority of the state, comes in here and says to these folks, uh, I heard from five or six people that Drew Wicker delivered a secret package in the dark of night in an alleyway on behalf of Nate Paul. Totally false. When he was asked, who told you that? Ranger? I can't even give you one name who told me that. Totally false. I asked the young man directly, did you ever deliver anything at night? Did you ever deliver anything that had anything to do with public records? No. Never. Didn't happen. Look at the position you, these people, have put this man in and his wife. Prove your innocence, Attorney General. You've been convicted in the press. Prove your innocence now. If it can happen to him, it can happen to anyone. Foreclosures were stopped. There was a a, a press statement that multiple foreclosures were stopped because of some informal guidance. Now we know that's false too. Presumed false. And these people, these people got up here and used words like conspiracy, crimes, bribery, all kinds of really loaded words and all were false. And this young man, Vassar, who cried on the stand in front of all of you because he had been called a rogue employee, at the very time he was called a rogue employee, he was joking and laughing and poking fun and calling his new boss, Brent Webster, a jerk. But when he came in here at the urging of these people, he cried. He cried because he had been called a rogue employee. What is a rogue employee? A rogue employee is somebody that doesn't do what the boss says. You don't do what the boss says? Let me tell you something. When I was a captain in the United States Marine Corps and my staff sergeant didn't do what I told him to do, he can, he can register his disagreement, but when the rubber meets the road and I tell him we, this is what we're going to do, he does it. Or he resigns. What he doesn't do, what he should not do, what he will should never do is go behind my back, cook up bar complaints, cook up a bunch of foolishness, and go to the authorities. 
That's not how it's supposed to work. This guy, Mr. Vassar, Mr. Vassar came here, cried on the stand about being a rogue employee, but really the truth is at the same time he was called a rogue employee, he was laughing and joking about it. What foolishness is this? It's been three years since the so-called whistleblowers. Now think about what a whistleblower means. That means that you have to have evidence of a crime and they admitted they had no evidence of a crime. And what have we heard from the FBI with regard to Attorney General Ken Paxton? Crickets. Nothing. Nothing. If you don't think, if you don't think that the Biden administration and its FBI and Department of Justice would not love, would not love to indict Ken Paxton, then you're not paying attention. They've done nothing. You know why they've done nothing? Because there's nothing to do. This man did his job. And he should still be doing his job. Staffers were not only wrong on their assumptions, they were wrong on the law. Can you believe that they didn't realize that the only person in that office that can actually have the authority to sign an outside counsel contract was Ken Paxson himself, and anybody else was designated. He's the only one that can do that. They didn't like that. This is a situation where the tail is wagging the dog. Imagine if your staffs, one of your staff members at some point decided that, you know what, I don't think my boss has authority. I, I know more than the boss, so I'm going to be in charge now. That is not how it works. 4.2 million people decided who the attorney general would be. They didn't elect Jeff Mateer, Ryan Vassar, Ryan Banger, none of those people. Those are political appointees serving at the pleasure of the attorney general, just as every one of your staffs are as well. They even had the nerve to come here in front of you and say, well, I believed that when Ken Paxton was in Ohio doing his job and trying to put together a group of attorney generals in a case against Google, well, he's out of the state. Now we're in charge. That is not how it works. That is not how it works. Let's cook up a bar complaint against Ken Paxton. Let's, let's allocate $50,000 to hire an outside lawyer by the name of Johnny Sutton without any approval or telling the boss. They figured out real quickly once they talked to Maxwell that, you know what, we don't have anything. We need to beef this up. We don't have anything. And even though it's been three years, they still don't have anything. And 17 lawyers over there working since May, $500 an hour for each of them, hundreds of thousands of dollars wasted, taxpayer money wasted, and they still don't have anything. Now, how did this happen? Well, they made some assumptions and then they figured out they had no evidence and it was too late to turn back. Recall that one of the witnesses, Mr. Mateer, Mr. Banger, said, well, once we went to the FBI, we were signing our death warrant. Rightly so. You go to the authorities with no evidence and accuse your boss of a crime and there has been no crime and there's been no evidence of any crime and it's all a bunch of supposition and guesswork? Rightly so. And so they, they took a long walk on a short pier. The house managers did the same. The house managers did the same. They 
in a four-hour hearing, decided to impeach the Attorney General of the state of Texas, and then they spent months and months trying to collect evidence to support it, and they did not. They failed. And then the lobbyists got involved. The text of support, TLR, yeah, we, we were against Ken Paxton. We spent $6 million against Ken Paxton. We couldn't beat him at the ballot box. Maybe we can beat him. Maybe we can beat him in an impeachment trial. George P. Bush decided, let me re-up my law license because maybe I can be the attorney general now. I couldn't beat him in a, in a, in a fair fight. Maybe I can beat him here. And every one of these so-called whistleblowers, which are nothing but disgruntled ex-staffers, they all hired the same lawyer who just happens to be in the Ashcroft Law Firm, who just happens to be a protege of the Bush regime. The Bush era ends today in the state of Texas. Have you ever met a lawyer that works for three years for free who's a former U.S. attorney who's doing legitimate work? Legitimate work? I want to focus the the allegations as best as I can tell of what Nate Paul provided to our attorney general are in three buckets campaign donation, house renovations, and Olson job. Let's focus on the first one. The the allegation is there was some sort of quid pro quo. You have to have a quid pro quo for bribery. They're throwing this, this word bribery around. That has a lot of meaning. In this case, it has none. And let's focus on the person who supposedly bribed our attorney general. This pain in the butt This described pain in the butt, Nate Paul. Entitled, insistent, overbearing, manipulative, pushy, threatening, presumptuous, brash, assertive, forceful, militant, but he really believed that he had been abused by the federal authorities. And let me ask ask you a question. Do we really believe that the federal authorities do not sometimes abuse people? Do we believe that? Do we believe that the FBI is always on the up and up? Do we really believe that the Department of Justice is always out to do the right thing? Or can we all agree that sometimes they pick and they choose who they go after? And when the federal government comes after you, you better buckle down. This guy thought he had been targeted by the FBI. And the only thing that this man did was, let's find out the truth. Let's see if that's really true. That's all he did because he knows a little bit about people coming after you with no evidence. He can identify with that. Heck, we see it here. The very reason I'm standing here, he was come after by a group of misinformed, ill-advised people with no evidence. That's what... Now, do I know whether that search warrant was altered? We will never know. We'll never know. Nate Paul thought it was. We'll never know. And to suggest that the keys of the Attorney General's office were turned over to Nate Paul, look at his correspondence. He was madder than a hornet's nest with the Attorney General's office. You're not doing your job. You have a conflict of interest. You guys are negligent. You're grossly negligent. He was mad, he was pissed. Because the attorney general's office would not do what he wanted them to do. He wanted them to investigate. If you look at the correspondence from Nate Paul senators and you compare it to what you just heard from Mr. Murr here, you're going to see two different stories. Nate Paul was very unhappy with the attorney general's office. That does not sound like somebody who had the keys to the office. He kept accusing the attorney general's office of not being neutral. He accused the attorney general's office of having bias. He accused the attorney general's office of being in the bag for the MIDI Foundation. 
He accused the attorney general's office of, of, of employing people that were against his interests. That does not sound like somebody who's running the attorney general's office. There was one person running the attorney general's office, and that man is sitting right there, and that is the man that should be running the attorney general's office at the end of this day. But I urge you to look at the correspondence and compare it with what you've heard, not only from these people, but in the media. Nate Paul was very, very upset and very, very unhappy with the Attorney General's office. So much so, so much so that he threatened to sue, that he sent a letter and said, hold all of your correspondence because I am going to sue you guys for your negligence, for your bias. When you look at the documents and you compare it to the arguments, you see a much different picture. Now, the allegation, the first bucket is a campaign donation of $25,000 made in October of 2018. Everything that you have heard in this case was in 2020. So think about that for a minute. Their entire case, a campaign donation, a bribe, if you will, two years prior, Complete ridiculousness, especially when you look at all the other people that Nate Paul gave money to, and especially when you look at the percentage just in the year 2018 of the donations received by Attorney General Ken Paxton. This man is a fundraiser. There is a reason that he raises money politically because the people like what he does. The people like Ken Paxton. We know that a campaign donation as a basis for bribery is complete hogwash. Imagine. Imagine if a campaign donation were considered to be a bribe two years before the acts complained of. Line up! We're going to be doing a lot of impeachments in the city of Austin. That bucket has no validity. That bucket is empty. And let's look at the buckets of what Ken Paxson supposedly did for Nate Paul. Foreclosure guidance, CAMIC retention, public records, and MIDI intervention. But what you heard from the young man who spent more time with Ken Paxson than anybody sometimes 24-7, 365 days a year, as there was never an agreement at all. He never agreed to do anything for Nate Paul and never got a darn thing from Nate Paul, with the exception of a lunch. A lunch. A lunch that was public, on a patio, for everybody to see. Most of the time... You would think when people are doing something untoward, they want to hide it. These were public lunches for everybody to see. And if a lunch is a bribe, then boy, howdy, we got a problem here, do we not? That holds no water. Let's look at Article 1. It fails just in its language. These people don't even know the goal... The, the role of the Attorney General's office. It is not a public protector of charities. It's a public, it's protector of the public's interest in charities. And we know that previously, Greg Abbott, as the Attorney General, had sued the Mitty Foundation as a long and sordid history. But it's not just a history of problems. There is a recent history, starting in 2019, and I urge you to look at the evidence at the memo that was submitted, at the memo that every one of Ken Paxson's subordinates reviewed before they all signed off on the intervention. This was not Ken Paxton causing anybody to do anything. This was subordinates who reviewed the evidence provided and decided we need to intervene. And it goes on and on. People punching their 
spouse, people being indicted for this and that, all kinds of problems. And the most important problem, the thing I think that, that the subordinates were really concerned about is this charity that was only worth $15 million total is investing $3 million into a speculative land deal. The bottom line is, every single... And what's so ironic and what's so egregious is that every single person who signed off on the intervention in the first article of impeachment came here and testified that that's somehow wrong, but they all, they were involved in it. Utter hypocrisy. They not only signed off on the intervention, which only lasted three months, but they also signed off on an investigation of the Mitty Foundation. That article fails, period. Did they prove anything beyond a reasonable doubt with regard to that article? The only thing that we've, that we've seen beyond a reasonable doubt in that article is the Mitty Foundation has major problems and that the AG's office intervened and now the Mitty Foundation stands to make millions upon millions upon millions of dollars on their speculative investment. Man, I wish I could get an investment like that. $3 million investment, they stand to make almost $20 million. That hurts really good, doesn't it? So we know the intervention is hogwash. Let's go to the written legal opinions under 402, Article 2. Well, it fails on its face because there was no written legal opinion, period. You heard our lieutenant governor charge you and explain to you that they have to prove what is in the article. They cannot prove this article because there was never a written legal opinion, period. That article is over. But, I mean, it's over. You can see it. This is informal guidance. This is not a legal opinion, period. But let's go a little further. They tried to drag Senator Hughes into this foolishness and put his name in this article for what reason, I don't know, and act like having a straw requester was somehow wrong. And we all know the people that, that work in the state's business in this city know that straw requesters are common. Every one of the House Board of Managers has been a, quote, straw requester at one point or another. We know that. And to put that in a public article, to somehow besmirch Senator Hughes is foolishness. But what was in Ken Paxton's mind when he was looking for this informal guidance? Well, if we want to know, we can look at his text. His text sent directly to Mr. Bangert, who was working on the informal opinion. Look what he says. I think that it will impact people's lives in a good way if we do this right. Hundreds of people will be protected from harm and maybe devastation. These are real-time texts. This is not three years later with a bunch of cooked-up foolishness. This is the real-time thoughts of our Attorney General as to what he was thinking with regard to the informal guidance. And did you hear Drew Wicker when he was asked about that? He said he knew a little bit about it. General Paxson says... We may prevent a grandmother from being thrown out of her home. And now they've turned this upside down. They've cooked it up and made it look somehow bad. And you know what's most ironic is, is the president, the president of the time, at the time, Donald Trump, a month later issued the same guidance. And we know, of course, Nate Paul put his entities in bankruptcy and there was never any foreclosures anyway. This is what we have to do. We have to get up here and prove our innocence. How wrong is that? And did you hear the, the financial guy from the bank get up here and talk about they didn't lose a penny? That they, they did, not only didn't lose a penny, they made a fortune.
That bucket's empty. Let's talk about the abuse of the open records process. Well, we've seen that that is bull. We've seen that the abuse of of misuse of official information, that was bull. Remember what you heard, that there was a secret delivery in the dark of night and a sealed package with top secret information. The problem with all that was all that information had already been released. (laughs) It was already public. It was already public. And then when young Drew was asked, did you, you checked out for the general a packet that had a CD in it. Was that what you gave to Nate Pauls? No, not at all. Total baloney. Never delivered any open records to Nate Paul. Never delivered anything secret. That bucket's empty. Article 5, the retention of Kamek. They say he was a prosecutor pro tem. Well, that crumbled on the stand, did it not? You have to vote on the language of the articles. That should be 30 to nothing. There was never a prosecutor pro tem. Game over. But we still have to prove our innocence. So ridiculous. The office of the district attorney made a referral. Mindy Monford, I want you to please pay particular attention to her affidavit. She was one of the subordinates of the elected DA and she made it very clear that it was her idea to do the referral. And you know what she said? I didn't think it was appropriate to send it to the Texas Rangers. I didn't think it was appropriate to send it to the FBI. So I referred it to the Attorney General's office. But guess what? It went to a Texas Ranger and a former U.S. Attorney and they didn't want to fool with it. We had... That's what you call a punt. We don't want to do it. Let's punt it. And then they tried to pretend like they weren't involved, even though Kamek didn't know how to do a grand jury subpoena, so he had to rely upon the DA's office to do it. They were intimately involved. They were actively involved. They were helping him get the subpoenas, and they never said, this is wrong. In fact, they thought, I'm glad you're doing it because I don't want to be investigating the people that I have to work with. And then when it was over, they tried to wash their hands of it all. I'm so, with all due respect, typical politician. And then lied about it. Margaret Moore sent a letter to the, that she made sure it was in the press that she didn't have anything to do with this at all. We all know that's not true. And she didn't even mention that there had been a second referral that was referred directly from the DA's office directly to this young man, Brandon Kamek. And that's the reason he sent the subpoenas that the DA's office helped him to issue. And they want to blame that on Ken Paxton, who had no idea about it. Kamek admitted, I never told him what I was, I, I was my idea to issue subpoenas. And I never told him who they were going to be issued to. Ken Passing could, could not figure out why the devil will Maxwell and Penley not do their jobs. Ken Paxton had a chance to investigate the feds. He wanted to investigate the feds. He wanted to because he had seen how they operate. Picking and choosing who they, who they convict or who they charge weaponizing, weaponizing the FBI, abusing their authority. He had an opportunity. He could not understand why his subordinates would not do their jobs. Instead of fighting about it, he got outside counsel. And this young man, Mr. Kamek, who had a signed contract from the Attorney General of the state of Texas, was dealing with somebody The Texas Ranger had decided in his mind on a Google search. Think about this. Imagine, I I was, I hope Dave Maxwell never Googles me. He had decided before he even looked at it that Nate Paul was a criminal. My God. 
if that's how if that's how criminal work is done, that 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 your top cop in the AG's office, based on a Google search, decides somebody's a criminal. Therefore, I'm not going to investigate his allegation of wrongdoing of the feds. We got a problem. We got a problem. He decided on a Google search that he wasn't going to do a darn thing. He was never going to investigate his old outfit, the Texas Rangers. He was never going to do that. He's in the Hall of Fame, for God's sake. And Penley's not going to investigate the feds because that's where he spent most of his career. And Ken Paxton said, look, there's, a, there's an allegation. Let's look into it. And the only thing he ever said was, just find the truth. So look at the points of view. You look through the prism. Ken Paxton's prism is sometimes the feds screw up. Kamek's point of view as a criminal defense lawyer is sometimes those who are making allegations are wrong and screw up. Maxwell and Penley, the feds never do anything wrong. The Texas Rangers never do anything wrong. And anybody that says they do, they're a criminal. God, that's fear. That's terrifying. That should terrify every one of you. And so he issued subpoenas and he thought he was a special prosecutor. He was outside counsel, special prosecutor. Whatever he was, he had the authority of the AG's office only to investigate. To investigate. And that's what the young man was doing. And he made it very clear in his testimony. He was young, inexperienced, sincere, and energetic. And he was asked point blank, did you think this was baseless? He said, heck no. I thought it was persuasive. I thought it was convincing. And I was excited to be involved in it. Because if what was being alleged were true, that would be a, quote, big deal. The only thing that Ken Paxson ever told that young man is seek the truth. That's what I suggest to you. Seek the truth. Nate Paul got nothing. Nothing. It's a darn shame that we have to come and prove that, but we did. And these whistleblowers, let's, so-called whistleblowers, in order to be a whistleblower, in order to be, let this sink in, in order to be a whistleblower, you have to have a good faith belief that a crime has occurred. In order to have a good faith belief that a crime has occurred, you have to have evidence. And you heard Mr. Vassar admit when he went to the FBI, he had none. He had some guesses. He had some maybes. He had none. And if these folks would have done their job, you wouldn't have had to spend the last two weeks of your time doing their job. And you can tell from the text. You can tell from the text of these so-called whistleblowers, which what they really are is disgruntled ex-staffers. They were combative. They were insubordinate. They called their brand new boss a joke. How long would somebody on your staff last if they were texting their support or their colleagues calling you a joke? You would fire them on the spot. He is a joke. We all know that when you bring in a new chief of staff, when you have a, a disagreement with your chief of staff and you bring in somebody else, that chief of staff is going to make sure that she or he brings in their own people. That's the way it works in politics, political appointees. And when you go to, when you come in and you talk to your subordinates and they say, I won't work with you, what happens then? They leave. Nobody was ever mistreated. Nobody was ever talked down to. They were treated with respect. That's not what Brent Webster, the new first assistant, got in return. What he got in return is screams, shouts, hollers, and talking behind his back and calling him a joke. And then they joked about being fired. They were so torn up that they were joking amongst themselves, calling themselves the cool kids club. The investigative report, I encourage you to read it. It's very lengthy. It's very lengthy. That's Article 7. It is documented and detailed. 
It explains everything that happened. It's a full investigation, and it's pretty darn good. And it lays out in great detail the events, and it's been unrebutted. They had a chance to bring Brent Webster, who was one of the authors of that report, who made sure that everything was documented. It's lengthy. It has exhibit after exhibit. It demonstrates that they did, in fact, take the attorney general's name off of the letterhead. It's there in black and white, the emails back and forth when they did that. It's in that report. Now they say the report is false. (laughs) And they throw around bribery. We know why they included this, don't we? Because it captures headlines. It captures headlines. And you know why they mention Laura Olson? Because it captures headlines. And they want to they want to shame people. They want to shame people. They want to be morally superior to us all. There's no reason to have done that to this family. There's no reason to have done that to this family. This woman got a job. She got it on her own merit, and she continues to work even today. She's getting checks from her job here in Austin even today. She has an apartment. She pays for her own apartment. That bucket is empty. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but let me say, I'm certainly not perfect, and I'm going to assume that all of you feel the same. Because we all have sinned and fallen short. The only person that cannot be forgiven is somebody who's so cynical that they don't ask for forgiveness. If this impeachment is based on a marital impropriety, then line up. Line up. We're going to be doing a lot of impeaching in this city. You should be ashamed of yourselves. Ashamed of yourselves. Bribery. They convinced Drew Wicker, based on a stray comment, that Nate Paul was paying for the renovations. It took me about 20 minutes to disprove it. They never asked for any of those documents. They never even asked. They never even, they never even talked to Kevin Wood, the contractor. They didn't even bother. They assumed it was true, and I had to come here on behalf of my client and disprove it. How wrong is that? And that was the most serious allegation. It wasn't just against the attorney general of our state, but it was against a senator in our state. Did you see young Wicker's face on the stand when I disproved it? I had to disprove it even to the general's body man. And let me tell you, the press reports that again, I'm going to be lining up a lot of lawsuits because that is absolute defamation. Because now we all know it's absolutely untrue. And that was the entire basis of this case. Supposition, and it can happen to you. Not even going to go through it. No burner phones, no secret email address, no promise to help Nate, no agreement with Nate. Nothing. Nothing. You should be ashamed of what you've done here. We showed you the transaction from front to back. Now, there was some suggestion that, well, he, he, he decided to pay because he knew they went to the FBI. Total baloney. The documents show something completely different. I urge you to look at Mateer's text and look at the text to Chip Loper on the payment. Look at the USAA docs that show that he was fighting with his insurance company trying to get paid for these very renovations and repairs that we have in evidence now. Every bucket of what General Paxton supposedly received, every bucket of what Nate Paul supposedly received, empty. Empty. So 
what do they do now? Well, you, you settle a lawsuit. You, you, the, a lawsuit was brought against the attorney general office and you went to the legislature, which is what you're required to do to get it funded. And the reason we decided to settle it, the reason they were begging to settle the case is because they didn't know what the Supreme Court was going to do. And Ken Paxton delegated that to one of his subordinates and said, hey, settle it if you think it's appropriate. And that was put before the legislature, and the legislature says, no, we're not going to pay it. And they were begging. The very people that came here to testify were the very people begging to get paid. Ah, it makes me mad. You have 10 minutes remaining in your time. So the Hail Mary, that's Roger Staubach. Remember him? That's a hell. The Hail Mary is, well, let's just throw in a bunch of malarkey at the end. Conspiracy, although there's no agreement and no furtherance of a conspiracy. Misappropriation, never happened. Dereliction of duty. Boy, when you're accused as a Marine officer of being derelict of duty, that's bad. Uh, let's throw it unfit for office, abuse of the public. There's no evidence to support any of the articles. That means there's no evidence to support any of these articles. These are thrown in later because as you deliberate, there's going to be somebody say, okay, you're right. There's no proof of that. But, 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 but we got this article. We're just going to, we'll use this to get him. We got to get him. We got to get him. Don't do that. That's not based on evidence. And that ain't the way it works. Just throw it at the wall and hope something sticks. That ain't the way it works in court. And that should not be the way it works in a historic impeachment proceeding. It holds no water. So why are we here? We're here because Dade Phelan got his feelings hurt. He was so drunk, so drunk handling the house business, knowing full well that they had no evidence to support an impeachment and they hadn't done their homework. When Ken Paxton says, hey man, you embarrassed the devil out of yourself. You should resign. They sped up the process and impeached this man. You've seen the video. It's all over the internet. You know, my favorite author said, justice limps along, but gets there all the same. We should have never had to do any of this because this case is a case about nothing. It's a case about nothing. And people are watching. It's not just these people. There are thousands upon thousands of people watching at home who will sit in judgment, who have watched the evidence, who have been shown what has been alleged and what has actually been proven and have seen that they don't match up. For me, as a son of a butcher and the son of a woman who worked in our high school cafeteria who had the just the gift from God to go to Texas A&M and then go into our United States Marine Corps and then be able to, to become a lawyer, a member of the bar of our state, to be called to defend the sitting Attorney General of the state of Texas is a great honor. And it's a great honor to stand here in front of you. I know in the fiber of my being that all of this foolishness that they've accused this man of is false. But the only question I have in my mind is whether there is courage in this room whether there is courage in this room to vote the way you know the evidence requires. I think there is. I hope there is. I pray there is. I'm asking you to agree with the 4.2 million Texans who put this man in office as Attorney General to put this man back to work. and vote not guilty.